Hi, this is Johan Sapin Bharatiya and we are here at Open Source Summit in Seattle and we have with us once again Mike Dolan, SVP and GM of projects at the Linux Foundation. Mike, it's great to have you back on the show. Nice to see you again. Yeah, it's just my pleasure to host you and there is once again a lot to talk about. And of course, uh, this morning I talked to uh, AWS Velky project, um, which is once again in response to what Redis was doing. Last time we sat down, I think it was Spain, uh, we talked about Open Tofu. So, so uh, I'm kind of seeing a pattern here, okay? But before we go into all those nitty gitties and all those things, uh, I want to talk about uh, a larger picture of open source, you know? I mean, open source keep going up, you know, companies do their things as the market changes. But in a couple of years, last couple of years, we have seen some developments which are not, I mean, I would not call them positive or natural, I think. What are your thoughts on things like these? I think we're we're, we're hitting a, a point where some organizations are looking for where's that next revenue bump going to come from? Where's that next uh, improvement to their valuation going to come from? And that's perfectly fine from a business investor perspective to have that conversation and think about it. Uh, where I think we're seeing an issue is that mucking around with the open source licensing that underpins a lot of software that people took a dependency on. And they took a dependency on it because it was open source. If it wasn't open source, they would have had a different conversation or a different evaluation of it, whether they wanted to take a commercial dependency on a commercial product um, that was being licensed to them. And so it's one thing where, you know, people who are doing startups right now go do a startup and make it commercial make it proprietary, use a source available license. All those things are fine if you're starting from that point and your value proposition to somebody is, hey, here's a source available license and you can see the source code and we can we can easily you know, talk about the source code and what improvements we might make to that source code. But they would be entering into that situation knowing that that is a source available license that they're getting into. Uh, I think the problem we have now is that you know, after, in some cases, a decade, of seeding this open source software out under a particular license, now suddenly changing it after there's other people contributing to the project, there's dependencies, it's become part of commercial stacks or solution stacks that um, somebody would not have chosen if they were making a decision about which commercial component to put into that stack. And so, or they might have built it themselves. And so, we have all these situations coming to a head now where some of these projects that have been out there for so long suddenly are flipping the switch um, and it just no longer makes the same value proposition sense for people to go forward if it's going to be under commercial terms. And um, I think the other aspect of it that people have maybe not uh, written about a lot is that there's real developers in these situations. Um, you know, when you look at an open source community, it's not your typical product development team. This is a community of people who get to know each other, who like working together. They engage online. They are, you know, this becomes part of their identity as a developer that they are contributors or maintainers to these projects. And when these companies are flipping the switch on the license, those developers who are out there in the community are suddenly completely cut off because while well, their lawyers and companies aren't going to let them contribute anymore and the, the maintainers of the project, the, the companies who are making these licensing decisions are essentially cutting them out of what has been their identity as a developer. And that's hard. You know, how do you go and say, hey, I'm no longer a Redis developer because they changed the license. I got to go find a new job. <laughs> that's hard for a developer. So I think what we're seeing is that from the top, you have executives and lawyers who made dependencies on open source licensed projects. And then you have the developers who are contributing, using, implementing, supporting it internally, now saying like, uh, I'm in trouble. And so they got to figure out a path forward and it, it becomes a build versus buy decision, right? And if you were working in an open community, then everybody already knows who each other are and they know how to reach out to each other and they're having conversations. Hey, maybe we should just keep maintaining this ourselves. And um, I think that's part of the, the discussions that's going to happen now as some of these licensing changes, if more come, um, is going to happen, which is, is this a build versus buy situation? And for developers, it's a, do I want to keep developing this situation? And when the developers get together, we see that they can move very quickly. Valky was announced 
or the license change for Redis was announced. And I think it was within a week we did the announcement with companies getting commercial uh, quotes approved, it went through legal reviews and everything else. You know, they moved quickly because they already knew who each other were. They already knew that this was something that they, they needed to have as an open option in that stack. And to have one company come and dictate the terms of it was just not going to work out. We have seen ups and downs in open source world, but uh, this is specific, you know, we're uh, using license, you know, to, to kind of solve a business problem. How disturbing you see as it, or we will talk about the impact as you touched upon, you know, developers, but we'll talk, but I want to, this is specific, you know, the, uh, with, with the HashiCorp happened and now Redis happened and other cases have also happened. Why you're seeing this is specific, you know, why are they resorting to license to solve a business problem? It's a good question. I, I honestly don't know the answer. I haven't talked to them about it. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what they would say, you know, why they chose license changes as the solution. But as an observer and somebody in the legal community who understands how licensing works at, at, at the core, the open source licenses, the core fundamental premise that they give you is that there's no use restriction. And everybody knows that in the open source community. And that's why open source has worked. Um, and the use restrictions that are being placed into these source available license where, you know, you can't be a competitor. We'll define competitor. Now they're trying to define competitor and, you know, well, that def definition of competitor can change. And what if they add a new product? Am I now suddenly a competitor because you added a new product? Like, so these are things where that's just never going to work. And OSI, you know, early on, the conveners around OSI made it very clear that use restrictions were not part of open source. And I think that is a fundamental principle that has endured to this day and is what keeps this all working. If somebody who is creating a product or a technology like a Terraform or a Redis or something like that, if they didn't want to release it without use restrictions, if they didn't want somebody else to use it that way, they should have not chosen an open source license to begin with. So for, on the one hand, I see, you know, maybe license regret, but there's also new management. There's new investors who have come along and they're trying a different game than what the original founders may have intended. And I think some of that is coming out and playing here. And I, I, I don't know enough about what's going on in all their board discussions and their investor discussions and everything like that. But I do, you know, expect that if people are making a decision to put something out under open source license, they understand the consequences of that are that you can't put re use restrictions on people. And the only reason some of these projects have become popular is because they were out there without use restrictions. If people had seen use restrictions when they were making the decision to take a dependency on these, they probably would have gone a different route. And so now that these projects are popular because they're out there with use restriction, with no use restrictions, suddenly changing the terms is, is you know, untenable in many cases. And um, I, I think there's a number of things about business models of these companies and you know what they should be doing. Changing the license isn't a really good business model. Um, you know, we've seen that before. And this, this has not played out well in many cases. And so I look at it, you know, as a, a not well thought out decision, but you know, I'm not a part of those conversations and I'm sure they put a lot of thought into it. But um, there's enough track record out there to show that this is not the right thing to do. There's other things you could do, adjusting your product strategy, uh, adjusting you know what your go-to-market is around certain uh, layers of the stack. There's different components that you can put around open core type of models and things like that. I don't know why they chose license. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, it's an odd thing for me to see that this is where they're going. It's an easy, quick hit. I can understand that. You're putting companies into an incredibly difficult position where they instantly have to make a decision because there's security updates or things that they need to get access to, and now they're suddenly cut off. And I, I, that's the only thing I can think of. But do you see that more companies will kind of resort to this, or they will look at open tofu, they look, will look at Velki, where the community is responding, and they're like, this is not going to bear any fruit. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, you know, MongoDB made a license change, you know, a long time ago. And, um, you know, Matt Ace, who kicked off the whole article about, um, you know, <laughs> the open tofu situation, you know, was involved in, others were involved in that. And, you know, it, I was surprised it went over as it did. You know, people just kind of accepted. I think a lot of people moved on to a different, you know, a, a different option out there. There's been a fork. 
Um, but I think Mongo has been threatening the fork for years. And so, you know, resorting to legal, you know, infringement or other, you know, issues is also not a productive thing in the long term, I think. But a number of these companies, they need to figure out how do I provide a value proposition that people want to pay for? And I think that's ultimately the question. And if, if they're going to say, well, you know, all these hyperscalers can just take this and offer it for free. Well, if you, if you're worried about a trillion dollar hyperscaler, they can go build this themselves. They never had to use your code to begin with. And so for them, it's just a small matter of allocating a small team to go build another option if they need to. And so there's no future where I think like a hyperscaler is going to take a core dependency for one of their core services from some third party whether it be a huge company like an IBM or whether it be a small company like Redis. They want to own that stack. They want to own their services. And so that's a big part of it. And if, if you're trying to avoid that, you, like, you need to figure out what to do that is your value proposition, knowing that they're going to have some core service that provides some type of functionality in that, in that domain. And there's other ways to go about this. Um, there's been many other companies who have made a lot of money around in and around open source who have figured this out. Um, I think it's the, 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 the time ramp to some sort of financial payoff is clouding maybe their judgment. What is the possibility that, you know, when people start a company with open source, you know, they have all those great, you know, vision, great idea, but as the company grows, leadership changes, new people come in, they bring their totally different view, different vision than it was of the creator of the company. So the DNA of the company changes, so it's not that much about open source that it was in the beginning, that it is now. So do you also see that as the company goes on its own journey, it actually deviates too much from the actual mission that they had in the beginning? So that these changes, when they do resort to them, it has very less to do with what founders wanted. I understand companies have to change and pivot. Like, I, I mean, I, I don't fault anyone for that. And, and so if you need to pivot a company, I would think through it in a thoughtful way about the open source community that you've curated that are all of your supporters, all many of your, you know, fiercest supporters are in these communities and they're alienating them in the process. And I think that's a challenge here. They're alienating customer end users, they're alienating developers, they're alienating this sort of ecosystem they 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 work around. An interesting conversation in the future would be the next company that wants to go do this, or even one of these companies that's already done it let's have a conversation about how do we build an ecosystem around the core product development, the core code development, because it's not a product. When you do it in an open source, it's not really the product. It's, it's a raw material upstream that they could be pulling from. And maybe they could do it in a neutral way under a foundation, for example, <laughs> which is where we come involved because nobody wants to go take a dependency on somebody else's owned thing right now when these things happen. So, you know, uh, I think a core thing is when we come together, we, we talk to the stakeholders, understand what they're willing to invest, what they're willing to put in, and maybe we can get other people who are willing to put development dollars into a neutral version of Redis um, that would have been, you know, they didn't have to be called Valky, but there was something that we could have done to bring people together and let Redis pivot towards its next product strategy or its different, you know, business model around it that hopefully would have helped them stay viable and help them with their revenue goals because just relicensing a technology because a whole bunch of people adopted it under a certain term is not useful. If we just look at it from a different perspective, the companies, you know, so they will, you know, evolve. But what I'm also saying is that when somebody creates a company around open source and should it be their responsibility in a way that the kind of people they bring into the company they do understand the they have those thoughts or because uh, that way they yeah. the, it, so that the company doesn't lose the track throughout the journey that dna the core is still remains right, so i i'm somewhat empathetic here that it's outside of a lot of founders control um you know i was talking to some founders of startups last night and i i just think that when they get into that situation they make a bargain which is give me some investment dollars so that i can even make this a reality and they give up some control in that process in order to dictate that it would be great to see them put terms around it or you know fight for that but 
um, they would have to be pretty savvy on both, you know, the financial fi financing aspects, the legal aspects, the governance aspects of things in order to effect that. And I don't think a lot of founders are in that situation to be experts at all of this at once. And I think that's a challenging thing where they're in a, they're in a dis disadvantaged position relative to the investors who have, you know, armies of lawyers willing to do whatever they want. And so I think um, it would be great if we could. I, I'm not, I, I, I don't think that a lot of founders uh, who have the right intentions have the ability to retain that type of control, unfortunately. Um, but there are things that we could do in the future. Um, there's things that we could look at, you know, around, you know, if there's a single vendor led, you know, open source project, I don't think we should you know, view all of those as risky. And that's one of the concerns I have out of this is that everybody's looking at, oh, this is a open source project, but it's one vendor. And are they going to relicense on me? And I don't think there's a lot of those out there that are not being relicensed and that are stable, that are good communities. And I don't want to put all of those into question and into risk. It's a certain set of investors who are going and making these decisions. Those you may categorize as risky, but um, there's a lot of projects. You know, what if Red Hat started re relicensing a whole bunch of its tools that it, it, it uses, you know, that would really change the game for Red Hat financially, maybe in 30 days, but what would happen to Red Hat over time, for example? And I, I don't say Red Hat's not even thinking about that, that I, I wouldn't even be in a conversation about that, but I just use that as an example where a lot of people are dependent on this open source. And, you know, IBM, for example, I was there for 10 years. We contributed a lot of code to open source. IBM's not out there relicensing its code. <laughs> you know, they have another business model because when IBM makes a decision like this, they know that everybody's going to get it on use uh, unrestricted use terms. And so you plan for that. You build a product strategy around that. You build a services model around it. You do things that generate revenue, but are not you know there just to exploit the license. If you look at this whole new trend, what does it mean for new startups, new companies who? would have gone with open source, but when they look at these changes, they're like, should we do it, should we not do it? That is one question part. Second part is, what role can Linux Foundation play there so that the founders with the, their pure intentions, they do know that the core code base will not go through this license change while investors can run the business that they want to run. So I'm looking at two different, I, yeah. past has passed, what we can I, do for there's future. a number of things that we could do to help founders who want to make sure that their code base remains open. Um, and uh, there's a number of things we can do to get that out there so that this isn't a future problem. If, if the founders want to talk to us about that and have a conversation, we're happy to do so. We, I'm an attorney. I, I don't provide them legal advice, but I can tell them here's the legal structure upon which would affect, you know, ensuring that your code and your, your things are, are available in the future under neutral terms. Um, you know, I'll give an example of Solomon Hikes, uh, who founded Docker. You know, Solomon did a few things early on, which I think were immensely useful for the entire industry. Uh, working on creating open container initiative, putting the container image specification and runtime out there under neutral open governance was critical to the adoption of containers and what we now think of as Kubernetes, you know, probably wouldn't have worked out if we didn't have that neutral container. And, you know, that was something where Docker had intellectual property there. They were willing to make that available to everyone. And it allowed this entire industry to flourish. It didn't necessarily help Docker because they couldn't go and relicense everybody's containers, you know, five years or 10 years later. But um, it allowed them to build other products. It allowed them to pivot. They went and did other things. They're not, um, you know, solely dependent on that. But that core fundamental technology being out there without use restriction enabled so much new startups to come up. I, 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 most of our startups that we work with, many of them are in the cloud native space. Um, and they all exist because there is something called an open container initiative with an, a truly open specification for that. What we did is we created this fundamental standard around a trademark that was neutrally owned. It was an open governance process around that core little piece just the container uh, image spec specification and format. And that allowed all of these other things to be created. And new the folks who are working on new technologies, they want to build a new company around it. And what would be, of course, not as an attorney, what would be your advice if, 
if they're going open source, you know, this is what you should do. Otherwise, it's, there's nothing wrong in going proprietary, but if you are going open source, this is what you should do so that we don't fall through these cycles again. What would be your advice to new founders? I was having a conversation with Stephen O'Grady this morning on this topic, and um, we both were like finishing each other's statements, which is, are you sure you really want to do open source? Because I think that's uh, a fundamental thing. There, there's there's this thought that open source will get you this community rapidly and build out a developer ecosystem rapidly of people who are adopting or playing with your, your technology. Open source may be useful from a certain stack component or something like that, but do you really want to make your whole product open source is a question people should ask. And I don't say that because I'm anti open source, obviously. I'm very pro open source. But the idea that just making it open source is going to suddenly make it widely useful in terms of a, a business value proposition is, I think, a fallacy. I think you really need to think through what is your business model? Are you sure open source really makes sense? And are you precise about which components and things you're going to do under open source? Because the moment you open this up, there is an expectation that the ecosystem, this becomes part of the community. And that's one of the most troubling challenges with Valky. We would have probably announced Valky in 72 hours if it wasn't for the name. They had to come up with a new name. And it's like, okay, our community has to rename now. What do we call ourselves? And that naming is, I think I've told you before, one of the hardest parts about setting up a new project. So yeah, it, it took a week, but we could have probably done it in 72 hours if, uh, if we had a name ready to go. So, you know, that's part of the challenge of these things is that it's disruptive to these communities. People identify as part of the Redis community now have to say, oh, I'm Valky now. I'm part of the Valky community. Um, and I think, you know, if we had been intentional, if this was, you know, similar to the Solomon situation, if Redis had come to us and said, hey, let's make this, you know, a core, central, neutral component, but all these other things we're going to go do on our own proprietary format, we could have pulled an ecosystem together from their existing community, worked on setting up that governance, setting the right expectations with everybody, and gone through a very different process than what they did. And if you look at the other side of the aisle, customers, users, even developers, uh, when they look at the, a company which is owning the source code completely, even if it is open source at that point, how much should they trust that, number one? Number two is that, is that a sustainable model for open source or moving your code base? It could be a foundation, like any foundation, or it could be something where there's only not just one stakeholder, not just one owner. What would be the ideal, you know, that model people should look at? I mean, there's there's a lot of different models you can do from different types of consortium models or you know contractual lockups and things like that. There, there's a number of different ways they could do it. I, I think the core thing is that you neutralize you know ownership of the sort of community name that they're using. That you know somebody could be create derivatives of that easily without you know having to go do a, a whole lot of work. Um, if your whole business value premise is that it's really hard to fork my code base. That's, I don't know if that's really, you know, a great business model, so to speak. So I, I think I would focus on, you know, looking at the aspects of, you know, what truly do you want to work on together with others and make available for others and make with others. And if you understand that, then you can figure out where your product portfolio fits into that and how to, you know, set up everything else. Um, you know, I look at, a number of the commentary that comes out in the press and you know, there's a, a number of these relicensing companies who went out and said, oh, but we can, we're doing this because we have to be able to compete with AWS or some big hyperscaler um, and because they can just take our code and not, not contribute. Well, in many cases they were contributing or they were being denied contribution. <laughs> um, so it's, I don't think that's really it. You know, if you really look at what's going on, if you look at Open Tofu, for example, none of those companies are hyperscalers. The companies involved in that fork are small companies that, again, took that fundamental value proposition of here is source code that is available without use restriction. And they went and built something else around that. They built a value proposition that wasn't just that source code. And I think that's the fundamental challenge here is you have a bunch of small companies out there who are seeing this, who are seeing that, you know, this core can be open, but we can compete at some other, you know, part of the stack. And they're going to be out there out front. They're going to be out, you know, racing ahead and they've got a different value proposition that, you know, 
hopefully, you know, pays out in the end so that they can keep contributing back to the core of Open Tofu. And when we launched Open Tofu, I think one of the most interesting things is one of the end users got up on stage in Bilbao, Allianz, and said, we are supporting this and we're going to go in this direction. You have an actual end user company of that scale saying this is important to us that this be truly open and under uh, an open source license. I think that's a great thing. I think people are now standing up. Whereas, you know, when MongoDB happened, everybody was kind of like shell shocked and they just kept going their own way and everybody else just switched or dealt with it. I think now uh, companies who have built solutions who are dependent on this, who are part of these communities are saying at the company level, this isn't okay. And at the developer level, they're saying we want to stand up for this, for our community and fork. And so the right to fork is, you know, here. But I think the reason companies or users are standing up is they do know there is an organization, you know, that can back it up, you know. Otherwise, you know, a small contributor, they cannot for the code. The code will not uh, survive for that long. Uh, in past, Linux Foundation has played a kind of passive role when it comes to open source, but with open tofu and now with well, I'm seeing a more active role in this space. Is it because you know you did feel that you know yes the community, I mean yes you can create a home for projects you know that hey co people come and contribute, but when something wrong goes on there, somebody has to be there to stand up too. So I want to understand the role of Linux Foundation in this space now. I think what we do is we help people with like interests find each other. And so when somebody comes to me and says, hey, you know, Redis relicense is really gonna impact us. I wanna, like, are there others who are having the same problem or others who are talking about the same issue? And then others come to me and complain about the same thing. I can say, hey, you all should talk to each other. Let's get a conversation going. And so at one level we are passive but we are conveners of people of like minds. And so I think that's, that's a key component of it. I think the second aspect is, I, I don't know what HashiCorp was thinking when they sent a legal cease and desist letter for copyright infringement, but um, we put a lot of structure and rigor around the legal frameworks for what we do. At the Linux Foundation, we take intellectual property very seriously. Um, when I joined IBM, it was right when the SCO war kicked off between IBM and SCO. And, you know, SCO was accusing IBM of infringement of, you know, the same nonsensical proportions. Now that case is still, I think, ongoing in, in the legal court system, but, uh, you know, it's obviously changed quite a bit. At this point, you know, the Linux Foundation, you know, one of the things that we do, we invest a lot in legal side of things. So we have, I'm an attorney, we have all two other attorneys, three other attorneys on our team in house. We have probably 50 to hundred outside counsel we work with around the world. So when we set these things up, we do it in a legal framework that we know is pretty buttoned down and we provide our projects with guidelines and, and best practices that we know will stand up to scrutiny. And uh, I think that's another reason people are choosing us for these, for these forks is because they're not really sure how to do it. A lot of companies have never forked another company's code base. What are the things that we need to think about from a trademark perspective? What are the things we need to think about? When you see some of these early communities go out and say, hey, we're forking, a lot of times they use names for their project that are not helpful. And so we help them understand maybe there's a different name that you should be choosing. And so we work through them with that process. And we, it's not that we had a forking playbook. Uh, because we weren't forking a lot of projects either. Um, the first fork I got involved in really was the IOJS fork of uh, Node.js way back when. And um, that was an unfortunate situ situation. But I think a lot of these forking situations, it, everybody says this isn't the best way we could have gotten here. It just happens to be what we had to deal with. And I think we're in the same boat here. I don't think there's animosity towards the developers of Redis. There's not animosity towards the developers of Terraform. If we got all those developers together and say, hey, you're all under open source licenses again, you can collaborate, they'll be collaborating in 20 minutes. Um, you know, I think at the developer levels, there's a, a, a keen desire to collaborate on these things. And um, you know, it's a lot of the financial, the business, the other things that are getting in the way right now. And my hope is that they can all see through that. And maybe the Linux Foundation could be not just a convener of the fork, uh, 
maybe the reason they're coming to us is not just because we know the legal parameters about how to do this, but maybe they're coming to us because also down the road, maybe there's a path towards reconciliation and bring everybody together. Because if you look at what happened with Node.js and IOGS, they forked, it was very public, it was a very nasty type of situation. But over time, we were able to bring everybody back together. And there was actually, ironically, a a uh, movie that was just recently released by the OpenJS Foundation telling the story about how this all came together. And there was a lot of animosity, but now looking back at it years later, everybody was very positive about it. They, they understood, you know, here's why we wanted to work together. And they were able to bring things back together. And that's a great thing. Of course, kernel is fundamental technology. Kubernetes is foundational technologies. You folks announced OPIA also, you know, for the AI and cloud native. What are some of the other big problems that you see that might need Linux Foundation help? Oh, that's a <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I, I think in some ways we are passive and we follow in the wake of where communities are going and what they want to work on. So um, we really are not an organization that say sets the, where the next technology trend is or here's what the next thing is that that is coming. But we do see breadcrumbs of where our members, our developer communities are going and what's interesting to them. And I think that that's a fascinating thing. That's actually part of why we created LF Research. So Hillary could get some of these early bread comes out there so people would see when, when LF Research is doing a report on a particular technology area, it's not because we you know, just happened to pick that topic that day. It's because we're seeing a lot of breadcrumbs pointing in that direction. And what LF Research tries to do is help people figure out what is going on in this space. Why is this interesting? Why is this potentially valuable to people? And so, um, you know, when I look at what things are coming, I look at things that are the next generation of open solutions, um, which come from a lot of areas that may have older, stodgier standards. I'm, I'm really curious to see where healthcare goes, for example. Um, we've been having some conversations around healthcare. Uh, LF Research is in those conversations. Um, I think that the the way healthcare is done in the United States and, and around the world is not optimal. Um, there's issues around you know single vendor entire control of per certain parts of the electronic health record stacks. There's issues around uh, the portability, data portability, um, things that impact delivery of care. And then there's a whole security morass. Healthcare is the number one targeted industry for cyber attacks. Um, they do not have the most modern up-to-date structure. They are not the best on their patching practices in many cases. How do you help defend an, uh, an entire industry and modernize their infrastructure is on the table. And if you think about what sorts of technologies or d development models have worked to help rapidly innovate to help improve transparency to help improve portability i think open source is in there somewhere and so i'm curious to see where healthcare is going to go um i look at you know th there's already trends well underway that you know are early stage still around ai um you know things around you know digital ledger technologies and blockchain that sort of had this hype cycle. They'll have their down cycle at some point, um, but there is ultimately a place for them. There is something in that technology that adds a different unique value that I think will long-term prevail and be something that becomes part of, of the stacks. And so I look at, you know, some of the conversation that Hedera was leading on stage this morning in the keynotes is, you know, maybe cryptocurrency isn't the best use of a, a, a digital ledger technology, but there is something else that allows a network of people to have a trust in the data that they're taking a dependency on. And I'll, I'm interested to see where that goes. Mike, once again, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this really important topic today. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's so much you know, going on, so I look forward to talk to you again uh, as new things develop. But thanks for uh, having especially me. In the thanks, uh, healthcare industry, but thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.